Every year, mortgage providers lend billions of pounds to property investors, but only a fraction of those investors understand how mortgages actually work which means they're wasting a lot of money. So in this video, I'm going to give you our buy to let mortgage blueprint, which explains the seven key things you need to consider so you can get the best deal and make your investment as profitable as possible. Most people view mortgages as a means to an end, a way to buy something that you can't afford to purchase outright. But to succeed as an investor, you really need to change that mentality. To explain what I mean, I want you to imagine you've got hundred thousand pounds to spend. You can either buy an apartment outright for the full 100,000, or you can put down four 25% deposits and let the bank put up the rest. Let's then assume that whatever you buy goes up in value by an average of 4% per year, which is less than the true average over the last 20 years. 10 years later, if you'd bought the 100,000 pound property, it would be worth 134,000, meaning you now have an extra 34,000 pounds in equity which represents a 34% return on your investment. But if you'd used mortgages to buy four properties totaling £400,000, they would now be worth £537,000. That's a £137,000 increase, which includes a 137% return on your investment. Now, in practice, you'd need to put in more than £100,000 in both situations because of stamp duty and costs. And of course, you'd be taxed on your gains when you sell. But let's not lose sight of the basic principle. If you buy three or four times more property, you're obviously going to make a bigger gain if prices go up. And if you don't expect them to go up over the long term, you're probably not going to be investing in the first place. Okay, that all sounds great in theory, but now you've got to pay back four different mortgages, right? The repayments will be huge and eat into your profit at best and leave you subsidizing the loss from your own pocket at worst. Well, not necessarily. A few years back, we were working with an investor called Matt, who'd grown up, as many of us did, with the idea that debt is bad and you should eliminate it as quickly as possible. He was making overpayments to pay down the mortgage on his own home faster, and he couldn't grasp the concept of taking on debt and deliberately not paying it down for as long as possible. Matt was a numbers guy. So we put together an example to show him why we, and the vast majority of investors, use interest only mortgages. This is where, as the name suggests, you only pay off the interest each month. And in 25 years, you owe exactly the same amount as when you started. We asked Matt what he thought the average rate of inflation would be over his 25 year mortgage term. He said 3%. So we showed him that if that was the case, 100,000 pounds borrowed today would be worth the equivalent of 47,000 pounds in 25 years time. In other words, the number of pounds he owed would be exactly the same, 100,000. But its real world value would have halved. If the property value, the rent, and his earnings went up in line with inflation, paying it off would become a whole lot easier. In fact, if he'd bought two properties with a 50,000 pound mortgage against each, he'd be able to sell one to clear the debt on both and end up owning one property free and clear. I could tell we had Matt's attention, but he still had one more question. What about those interest payments? Surely we'd forgotten to factor those in. Well, no, because we pointed out that his properties would be making a rental profit even after paying all costs, including the cost of the mortgage interest. The repayments would be taken from his account, but would be effectively funded by the rent. Then we threw in one more fact. Having an interest-only mortgage doesn't mean you can't pay down the capital if you want to. Most mortgages allow you to overpay by a certain amount each year. And if you want to, you can pay off lumps every few years when you come to remortgage. What they really offer is the flexibility not to be locked into making repayments on a fixed monthly schedule. So, like me and most of our clients, to this day, Matt still hasn't paid off a penny of his mortgages. A couple of years later, Matt came back to us because he was earning a pretty respectable £60,000 a year, but he just inherited a lump sum of £200,000. In principle, he could use some or all of this 200,000 as deposits to borrow even more and expand his property empire. But he wanted to know, would his 60,000 pound salary support that much borrowing? Well, as we told him, lenders are surprisingly uninterested in how much you're earning. Most of them have a minimum income requirement, but this can be as low as 20,000 pounds a year. What they really care about is the value of the asset you're buying and the amount of rental income it produces. There's a formula for each of those, and the amount you can borrow is determined by the lower of the two numbers that pops out. The first is the value of the property, which is very simple. 
how much of the property's total value do you want to borrow? Typically, the maximum you can borrow is 75% of the property's value. And if you're borrowing 60% or less, rates tend to get a bit cheaper because lenders feel they're taking on less risk. The formula that's based on the rental income is a little bit more complicated, but you can plug in some numbers and see it for yourself by using our free mortgage spreadsheet that you can download using the link in the description. Essentially, the lender will look at your monthly mortgage payments, then want your rental income to be higher than that, plus some extra headroom to cover your extra costs. This makes sense because they want the property to cover its own costs, rather than relying on you to put in your own cash to make up the difference. Typically, they want the rental income to be somewhere from 125% to 165% of the mortgage payments. In fact, though, they won't necessarily look at your actual mortgage payments. Instead, they'll assume a higher rate than you're actually paying. This is a stress test that checks you'll still be able to cover your payments even if your mortgage rate goes up in future. If your property fails this test based on the amount of rent it produces, then the amount you can borrow will be reduced accordingly. For example, you might want to buy a property for £135,000 and borrow 100000 That's just under 75% of its value, so no problem on that front. But based on the rental calculation, you may only be able to borrow £90,000. This is around 67% of the property's value and means that you'd have to increase your deposit to put in the extra £10,000 yourself. This seems annoying and causes issues for investors in areas where houses are expensive and rents are comparatively low. But it's actually a good thing because it protects you against the number one risk of using mortgages, which is being forced to sell the property after it's fallen in value. Because although property prices will inevitably go up over time, if only because of inflation, that doesn't mean they won't drop back along the way. As long as you're making a profit, that's okay. You can keep paying the mortgage, keep putting profit in the bank, and hold on until its value recovers. So lenders are more interested in the property than you when deciding how much to lend, which makes sense because it's the rent that will be paying the mortgage. And ultimately, if you stop making payments, they will seize and sell the property. So they need to be sure of what it's worth. But lenders, like most of us, want an easy life. While they ultimately can repossess to get their money back, they really don't want to. So they also look into your track record when it comes to managing money. And by the way, whether or not you choose to own the property within a company, which many investors do for tax reasons, it's still you that they'll be looking at. The obvious first thing they'll look at is your credit history, and even a single missed payment will rule you out with a lot of lenders. They'll also want to see bank statements and might make some queries about how you manage your finances. This is less intense than when you're applying for a mortgage on your own home, because again, remember it's the rental income that will be funding the repayments. But it can still be a lot of paperwork and scrutiny. If your income comes from self-employment or investments rather than a salary, there could be even more questions. And if you're an expat, the amount of paperwork jumps up even further. But at least this is something you only need to do once. Well, actually, probably not. When you're choosing a mortgage product, one of the biggest decisions you'll need to make is how long to fix your mortgage rate for, if at all. You can get products that track the Bank of England's base rate and go up and down in line with it. But most investors want the security of knowing what their payments will be for a certain amount of time so they opt for a fixed rate mortgage. The most common durations of fixed rate are two, three, and five years, with the odd 10-year product being available. You'll need to take a lot into consideration to make a smart decision about this, including mortgage rates, product fees, how long you plan to own the property for, whether you want the option of borrowing more if the property's value goes up, what you think is likely to happen with interest rates in the future, and a whole lot more. Luckily, this isn't a decision you need to make completely on your own, as will come too soon. But generally, my approach, if I'm reasonably happy with the rates I'm being quoted today, is to fix for five years, purely because it's longer until I need to think about all this stuff again. So you might be thinking, this all sounds like a lot of work. Is it really worth it? Well, in my experience, yes, and I'll show you why using a real example of a property that I bought 10 years ago. I bought this property for £130,000, and back then it rented for about £800 a month, but now it's up to £1,200 a month. The property is now worth about £175,000, which sounds like a big increase, but actually only averages 3% growth per year over a decade. If I bought using purely my own cash and then sold it today, I would have made £45,000 before thinking about tax, which is roughly a 35% return on the cash I put in, including my stamp duty cost. But as I used a mortgage to borrow 75% of the purchase price, the uplift, of course, has still been £45,000, but that represents 123% of the cash I've put in. 
In other words, I've way more than doubled my money based on just 3% growth per year. And then of course, there's the rental income. If I hadn't used a mortgage at all, after deducting service charges, management fees, and other typical costs, I'd be making about £750 per month, which is a 6.8% return on investment. But again, I didn't do that. I borrowed 75% of the property's value. Even assuming a 5% interest rate, that's bumped up my return on investment to more than 11%. By the way, that's a very good return in today's market. But remember, this is after a decade of rents going up while the amount of cash I put in obviously hasn't changed. Now, in cash terms, I am banking less. Of course I am, I've got mortgage payments to make. So I'm only making £343 in pre-tax profit. But remember, I've put in less cash. So using my full cash pot, I could have bought pretty much four of these. If I had bought four identical properties, I'd be making £1,372 per month which is almost double the cash flow of that one property alone. Okay, so if you want to follow in Matt's footsteps or mine and start growing your portfolio with the help of mortgages, how can you get started? Well, my biggest tip is to start working with a mortgage broker who specializes in buy to let. Brokers will be paid a commission by the lender they place you with and they may charge you a fee too. But even if they do, I have no hesitation in paying this because the chance of me finding the best mortgage product out there on my own is almost nil especially when you consider that many lenders will only work via a broker, so you won't be able to access the full range of options on your own. A good broker will be able to help you through all the tricky decisions, like how long you should fix for, by calculating the total cost for you after taking account of interest rate and fee. And they'll also save you masses of time by making the application on your behalf and being the first filter in all the back and forth with a lender as they do their due diligence. But understanding mortgages is just the first step to becoming a better investor and a better landlord. So check out this video next, where I explain exactly how to find the right tenants and how much to charge.